State of the Game. Five space missions that'll blow your mind. At number five, meet India's very first interplanetary spacecraft, the Mars Orbiter, or Mangalyaan. It took off from just north of Chennai and made a series of increasingly elliptical orbits around Earth before slingshotting off on a 300-day, 780 million kilometre trip to meet up with Mars. In late September 2014, it hit the brakes and slotted nicely into orbit around the Red Planet, which made India the very first country in history that's ever achieved Mars orbit on the first attempt. To give you an idea how efficient Mars Orbiter's trip was, it fired its thrusters just 11 times for a total of about 80 minutes to travel three quarters of a billion kilometres. Things went so well that it's still got nearly 40 kilos of fuel left in the tank and it should be able to keep sending back photos and scientific data for years to come. The craziest thing about this one though, is that India managed to get the whole mission done for about 72 million US dollars, or nearly 14 times cheaper than this guy's house in Mumbai. That's not a bad effort. At number four, launched by NASA in January 2006, New Horizons quickly accelerated to more than 58,000 kilometers per hour, taking the record for the fastest launch speed of any spacecraft ever built. 13 months later, after making it through the asteroid belt, it hurtled past Jupiter and got a gravity-assisted speed boost of about another 14,000 kilometers per hour. On its way past, it took four months worth of fantastic close-up happy snaps of Jupiter and its moons, including this ripper of a volcanic eruption on Io. That spray is about 330 kilometers high. In relative terms, Jupiter's pretty close to Earth in the solar system, but the next stop for New Horizons was a lot further away, so it shut down and went into hibernation for most of the last seven years. Now, it's awake, it's nearly 5 billion kilometres from home, and it's just about ready to give us our first close-up look at Pluto and its satellite, Charon. So, how the heck does it send the photos back from that kind of distance? Well, New Horizons has a single 2.5 metre radio dish that can talk to one of three 70 metre deep space dishes back here on Earth. It takes about 48 minutes to download a single image. <sighs> Reminds me of my college days. At number three, of all humanity's crazy slingshots into space, the Rosetta mission might just be the most impressive. Here's the brief. A fresh comet has come into the solar system, sucked out of the Kuiper belt by Jupiter's enormous gravity less than 50 years ago. If we could just land on it, we might find a bunch of clues about what happened when the Earth and Sun were first formed, and how water and life might have started on Earth. But, it's more than 300 million kilometres away, it's travelling at more than 135,000 kilometres an hour, and the whole thing is just 4 kilometres in diameter. Oh, and nobody's ever landed anything on a comet before. This was going to require a golf putt of epic proportions. Luckily, we can be a pretty clever species when we put our heads together. The European Space Agency launched Rosetta in 2004, then swung it around Earth for a gravity slingshot that sent it out towards Mars. It zoomed past Mars just a couple of hundred kilometres from the surface around the back there, which slowed it down and pointed it back towards Earth again, although this time in a totally different part of our orbit. At this point, some astronomers spotted it heading for Earth and thought that it might be an asteroid coming to crash into us, before they realised it was Rosetta and started feeling a bit silly about the whole thing. This second lap around the back of Earth gave it another speed boost, which catapulted it out into the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter for a flyby of the Steins asteroid. And then it whipped back around Earth for its final and fastest slingshot, which took it right past the Letitia asteroid and gave it enough speed to rendezvous perfectly with Comet 67P 10 years after it first left Earth. That trip just blows my mind. I have trouble making a train connection. And from there, ESA had to push an unpowered lander out onto a wildly rotating, bizarrely shaped and very bumpy surface with almost no flat or safe landing zones. It was a risky move, and when the Philae lander hit the surface, it vanished. Rosetta couldn't contact it or wake it up. Months passed by with no response. 
Issa basically gave up hope, but an agonizing seven months later, Philae flickered back into life. As it turns out, the landing gear had malfunctioned, so it hit the surface of the comet, bounced around a bit, and then ended up on its side in a crevice. And that crevice blocked out the sun from reaching Philae's solar panels. So it took seven months before it got enough sun to power itself up again. Since then, it's up and running. Philae and Rosetta are collecting some amazing data about the history of our galaxy and riding the comet as it heads towards the sun. Numbers two and one are actually twins. Voyagers one and two left Earth in the year I was born in 1977. When they took off, Sony still hadn't built the Walkman. Phones looked like this. There were no CDs, certainly no mobile phones or internet, and seemingly no limits on bad taste. The world's most powerful computer was this, the Cray-1, with a massive eight megabytes of RAM and a clock speed of 80 megahertz. What we did have, though, was some ridiculously brilliant astrophysicists who were able to take advantage of a rare alignment of planetary orbits to send Voyager 1 and 2 on a grand tour of the outer solar system. The two ships passed Jupiter in 1979, then made it out to Saturn by 1981, making a bunch of discoveries there, including several moons and some amazing close-up photos of those famous rings. From Saturn, Voyager 1 did a close flyby of Saturn's moon Titan, which flung it off the plane that the entire solar system sits on, and eventually out of the solar system altogether, and into interstellar space. Meanwhile, Voyager 2 made the first and only flyby ever done past Uranus, <laughs> documenting this giant planet's wonky magnetic field and giving scientists a close look at its moon, Miranda. Miranda's shape and surface are so irregular that they think it might have been smashed to bits at some stage by some ancient collision, and then just sort of fell back together into a jumbled heap under the power of its own gravity. And finally, it completed the Grand Tour with again the first and only ever flyby of the blue methane planet Neptune and its moon Triton, at which point its fuel economy was equivalent to about 13,000 kilometres per litre. Remember when you're looking at these pictures, they were taken and relayed back to Earth using 1970s era equipment that's been battered by heat, cold, space dust and radiation running maintenance free for more than 35 years on a single nuclear power source. And they're still running. With more than 70% of their nuclear power remaining, Voyagers 1 and 2 have travelled further than any object ever made by man. Number one has got the furthest, it's some 19 billion 600 million kilometres away from Earth and still speeding onward. Its power source will flicker out sometime around 2030 and then it'll die. And if it doesn't smash into something, it could remain intact for billions of years afterwards. A lonely ambassador from the most brilliant minds of a civilization and a planet that may no longer exist at that time. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to subscribe and come visit us at gizmag.com.